you are listening to Single Service. My name is Arno Marchere, and I am your host. Single Service is a podcast dealing with design, architecture, business, and city building in which I interview an expert on a specific subject matter. Together, we dive into that topic and challenge conventional thinking in a thought-provoking conversation. I sincerely hope that you will find these conversations as engaging as I did and learn a thing or two in the process. Don't forget to send us your comments, criticism, and praise. To do so, you can email us at hello at rvltr.studio or leave a comment online. You can also subscribe to the podcast on our website at rvltr.studio. George Tannenbaum has spent well over half of his life in the advertising business, yet he still manages to be a nice and very funny guy. He currently makes a living working directly for clients and agencies. Before that, George worked at illustrious outfits such as Ogilvy, helping run their dream account, IBM. He also worked for RGA, Hal Reini and Partners, Ali and Gargano, and Lowe. In the course of his career, his work has earned many awards, and he also writes a popular advertising blog called Ad Aged, which I recommend you read because it's very funny. So thank you very much, George, for joining us today to talk about advertising and marketing and hopefully help us learn some important lessons in the process. I hope so. Thank you, Arno. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored. So tell us your, what you do in three sentences or less. What do I do in three sentences? Well, what I do from a work um, perspective is I, I listen to what clients' issues are. I translate that, which is often very complicated, into something that I think would appeal to um, their target audience. And then I try to make it fresh, funny, interesting, and impactful. Um, and that's really what advertising is. I guess it's a pretty, um, pretty compelling and easy to understand answer, which is not always uh, what we hear from people in the industry. Well, I don't, I don't like all the charts and graphs and you know, constructs that are patented. I mean, what we're supposed to do is find you know, something that makes, um, that explains how something works or explains why you need it and breaks through the massive amounts of clutter that are all around us. Um, and our job is to get noticed. It's very interesting to hear you describe it that way because most of the time, it, from a, a layman's perspective, it seems like the advertising process or industry is this giant black box of like obscure processes and, and techniques that people use. But hearing you saying that makes a lot more sense. So uh, I guess keep it simple, stupid is, yeah. is a way to go. Yeah. Um, so how did you end up where you are? Well, you know, I think most people um, end up with a combination of... Um, they don't know what else to do um, and a series of calamities. Uh, and I think that's how I ended up. I mean, my, my father was in the business. His brother, who was 20 years older than he was in the business. I never wanted to go into the business, but I, um, you know, I ran out of money for graduate school and I found myself in, in a very dangerous New York City in 1980 with no job and no money for rent. And I, um, I did what I knew how to do. I got, I, I took a class at School of Visual Arts. I got a job in advertising, and that was, uh, whatever, 42 years ago. And I've been in it ever since. The calamity part is, of course, anyone who knows me knows I got, at the age of 62, I got fired you know, from Ogilvy. I thought I'd be there the rest of my life, but they decided I was too old and too expensive, and I started my own business, which I never really wanted to do. But um, it's been two years now and it's it seems to be going very well and knock wood and so you know most most good fortune starts as a calamity um and that's what happened with me i see um and let's dive a little deeper into your your recent career change because and i think it's particularly prevalent in the ad industry from what i understand is that anyone over the age of 50 or something is considered past 30. its, its yeah. due date yeah, yeah. 30 yeah, I'm just I'm being cynical, but yeah, yeah, yeah no, it, I mean I'm, you're it, you're dealing with you know you're biding your time after forty certainly, and that's interesting because in my industry architects are not considered uh, to be mature before they're forty, and most of them right. start their firm in like in their forties, maybe mid thirties. Right. Um, so why do you think that is in the in the ad industry, and why would people with 
tremendous experience uh, not be not be considered the same way not, as young not people. Be valued. Well, I mean, you know, there's a there's a um, there's a macroeconomic answer, which is there's been incredible consolidation of the of the industry, you know, and so 75% of the industry is owned by four companies. They're publicly traded companies. Uh, their margins are very low. The only way they can continue to show margins is, is to, by getting rid of uh, people who make a lot of money. And so that's what they do. Um, and then that's one bit of it. That might be a cynical economic point of view. The other bit of it is you know, the industry has always been kind of youth obsessed on the uh, kind of a holdover from the 60s and the baby boom generation when the baby boom generation was such a large portion of the populace and had so much disposable income. You know, now, in point of fact, the younger generations who we still cherish uh, don't have the money that the older generation has, but we still are infatuated by youth and it, there's a lot more cool young people than cool old people, and nobody wants to be around uncool people in advertising. I see. I think that we'll leave it at that for now. I want to go back a little bit to um, more the marketing aspect of advertising. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, in your opinion, what makes a good ad? Yeah, there's to, to make it really simple, uh, and, and I wouldn't I wouldn't separate what makes a good ad from what makes a good communication. Um, a good, effective piece of communication needs three things. And this is true and has been true since hominids started talking. <laughs> it, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm deadly serious. Yeah, no, I, I'm not I, doubting that. I need to get your attention. If I don't get your attention, um, you won't look up from your, you know, from poking for grubs in the dirt or from your iPad. So impact is number one. The second is communication. What do I want from you? And the third is persuasion. Why should you do it? And that's if you think about if you have a child at home and the child cries, the crying is impact. The communication is, well, you're the dad. You're going to check its diaper. You're going to say, when was the last time we fed her? And the persuasion is it's your child. You'll do anything. But if you were meeting at someone at a bar, you're trying to, uh, you know, you were set up on a blind date, you need those three things. Impact, hi, I'm, I'm Arno. Um, I'm a really nice guy and I make a lot of money. We should, we should get together more. And if you do, we'll go to nice restaurants. And that's impact, communication, persuasion. That's, that's how communication works. That's how human beings have always worked. Yeah, that I, makes sense. It's pretty, I mean, you can't really argue with it. No, I'm with you. So in my industry and... I've been pretty vocal about this. Um, most of the marketing we see is pretty crappy because it's, mm -hmm. um, I think the primary reason is because people are targeting the wrong audience. They're, they're most of the time trying to impress their peers instead of trying to convince their potential clients to hire them. Right. And that's not true of everyone, but it's, it's pretty generally true. Um, and, and so, like you said, it's, it, it lacks at least one of the things you need to convince someone to do something. And it seems like you, it's something we see in the advertising or, or maybe the, the advertising that um, uh, greets me is, is advertising that's not targeted at me. And maybe that's why I don't like it. But it feels like a lot of ads are pretty crappy or pretty kind of low expectations. And why do you think that is? You know, I think um, one of the key things in, you know, um, our species is empathy. It's caring about who you're talking to enough to tailor a conversation, a sentence, the sort of language you use to who your listener is and to make something geared to them so it's important. So if you were talking to a six-year-old about a sporting event, you would use you might be describing the same event, but you'd use a different language and different metaphors and different descriptions than you would to an age peer or to your mom or dad. Um, I think, you know, many in the ad industry have forgotten that we're, like you just said about your industry, that the communication 
isn't supposed to work only in a conference room where it gets approved. It needs to work in the real world. So it needs to talk to the values, aspirations, beliefs, and sensitivities of the people viewing it, not the people paying for it. And that's a very, very interesting point. So how, as a communicator or ad person or marketer, do you make sure that this is the case and you don't miss the mark when you create something like that? Well, you know, one of the things I had on my blog recently, and I think you asked me about it, was, you know, this kind of five or six questions you kind of ask when you're creating something. And one of them has to be, will anybody care? So if I were showing, let's say you were building a uh, luxury apartment house for the billionaire class, you're probably not going to show them the incinerator room. They don't, they don't care. They might want to see where the pool is and the exercise and there's a home theater and there's a this and there's a concierge desk and all that, but they don't care where the incinerator room is. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't really care about that. So why would we talk about that? Now you might be L E E D, you know, verified and green, and it might be important to your industry and cutting edge, but if it's not important to the buyer, you got to go someplace else. I, I, I think we, we lose we, we don't ask ourselves why people should care about this. And so you mentioned the, the list of questions that you put together to kind of judge the quality of marketing. Can you walk us through them? Oh, yeah. Um, I got I to gotta pull it up. Just, so just give me a second because I don't, I got to refer to things. I don't, I have a near photographic memory, but that means it's not perfect. No worries. Um, I, I can edit that out. It's no problem. So it's basically, you know, what I realized was, kind of what we were talking about in the beginning is everybody thinks, you know, the advertising business is inscrutable and and complicated. It's really not. It's really simple. Um, So, you know, when I taught in ad school, you you know, you come in as an outsider, as a, as a, you know, creative director and you're teaching and the students are all cowering in fear of you and they think you're brilliant, whatever, but it's really just, looking at four or five or six questions before while you're evaluating work. Number one, is it on brand? Now, brands like television actors or movie actors have a voice. They have a look. Um, you wouldn't buy Clint Eastwood in ballet clothes. You would buy him dressed up as a cowboy. You know, so is it on brand? Does it look right? Um, would it stop you? In other words, are you going to pay attention? Are you, you know, are you going to notice the work? Does it make a promise? You know, even you send me an email about doing a podcast, you kind of making, you know, a promise to me, you know, it's a podcast, it's going to go out, people are going to hear it. It's, it's good for you, your brand, your personal brand. It's good for this. That's a promise to me. I either buy it or I reject it. Will Mm -hmm. anyone care? Is that promise important to me or not? If it's, if it's only going to go to, you know, 12 orphans in, you know, outer Mongolia, I'm probably not going to do it as much as I might in, you know, if it was going to a larger audience. Is it unique? People tend to notice things that are unique, um, that are different, that they haven't seen before. And, you know, just because we expect certain behaviors to come from having seen ads, do you know what to do next? Do you know how to buy the product? Do you know how to find out more information? That's fairly simple today. Every web, every product pretty much has a website, but do you know how to get there? And do you know what we're asking of you? Um, those are pretty simple um, um, kind of causalities. They're probably in many ways the same things you would do if you were meeting someone at a cocktail party. Um, you know, are you acting like yourself? Are you saying something important? Um, should they be interested? Are you like everyone else? And after the party's over, what do we do? Do we exchange numbers? Do I give you my email? Or are we just never going to see each other again? I mm-hmm. mean, it's not, it's really not that complicated. I mean, advertising in a in a weird way is a mass way of selling something one-to-one. So mm-hmm. the same thing, if I were selling, if I were a door-to-door salesman in 1927, I'd say, hi, I know I'm George. I'm selling this um, this incredible plastic bag. It comes out off a roller. You can put food in it. You can seal it, and it keeps it fresh for two weeks. 
that either gets you or it doesn't get you. And if it doesn't get you, I'd go on to the next one. Now we can do that on TV mm -hmm. or radio or whatever. Um, Mass media. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, I think those are great. I, th I believe seven com commandments to judge yeah. the quality of marketing. So I'll probably uh, dive a little deeper in those uh, sure. and, and put them in writing for my audience. I think that's a great, uh, great thing to start with. Um, would you make a distinction between effective advertising and creative advertising? And is there a way to have both at the same time? Well, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't pull them apart because if it isn't effective, but it's creative, it's not advertising because advertising by definition has to sell something or either change a mind or change a behavior or change your heart. Um, so if it's just, you know, I hired Annie Leibovitz, Annie Leibovitz to, or to, to, to do a beautiful shot, you know, a beautiful photograph for me, or I hired a famous director to shoot a commercial, but it doesn't effectively portray what I'm trying to sell. It doesn't convince you. I've made a film or a piece of art. I haven't made a commercial. I mean, a commercial, as the name implies, is a commercial. It's meant to generate commerce. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can separate um, the need to do something interesting with the need to sell. I think they go together. I think that's one of, been the, one of the false steps the industry has made over the last 15 or 20 years. And I could get very, very um, inside baseball and talk about with the kind of rise of direct marketing and data, we've separated the selling from the image. But I don't think you can really do that. I, I don't think you should really do that. I think effectiveness and creativity, the creativity is a, is, is a way to, um, is a way to make something more effective. So I may be wrong, but I, I believe that in the, um, the marketing corner where you have people who do like a uh, long form, a sales letter or direct response advertising, they would kind of scoff at the idea of doing something creative and are solely focused on like, say, writing copy that gets them the sale. Uh, right. But what you just told us is the opposite. So, um, and again, but, I'm no expert, so I, I'd right. like to have your opinion on that. Well, I would say, you know, that writing a long form, you know, direct response piece that hits, that, that presses my, you know, emotional triggers is an act of creativity. It might not be, you know, it might not be, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not just, It's not just an algorithm. It's it it has to get into my head and understand what my motivations are and convince me of something. So those same three kind of tiers of communication that I mentioned a little while ago, impact, communication, persuasion, are would be present in a direct mail letter, just as they should be present in a uh, Hollywood movie. Um You know, otherwise, it's all over the place. So, you know, creativity in advertising is the art of getting through to someone. It's not the art of using expensive photographers and directors or illustrators. It's the art of getting through to someone. How do you break through, you know, lethargy, um, lack of attention, lack of caring? How do you make an impact? That could be a psychological trigger. It could be, you know, a piece of artwork. It could be a million things. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think you always have to use creativity to find that thing. I, I'd hate to think that. I mean, I know there's agencies that call themselves marketing services agencies and there's agencies that call themselves creative agencies. But, you know, e even, you know, if you own a home or something and you have a, a chimney sweep come to your house and he's doing something fairly prosaic. You know, he has to be kind of creative in selling you the what he is. You know, if we don't do this, the ash will, the soot will build up on the chimney. You won't get good airflow. You won't have a good fire. If he doesn't make that story come across, he's not going to get the sale. Mm -hmm. That's that's the creativity he brings to his job. It's boring as hell, uh, maybe, but that's that's what he does. I see. That makes sense. So speaking of of that in general, is there um, a favorite advertisement? Of, of yours of all time or, or maybe a few that you can refer to that are all of the things you've described so far? Yeah, there's a, um, my favorite 
television commercial of all time um, is, I believe, a 1974 uh, TV spot that for Fiat that the Carl Alley agency did featuring a stunt driver. You can find it on YouTube or I can send it to you featuring a famous stunt driver called Remy Julian. Mm -hmm. And it talks about, um, you know, Fiat at the time in the United States was a relatively uncommon car. And it talks about um, how in Europe there are over 50 small cars to choose from. And you see Remy Julian, you know, driving downstairs. He's being chased, driving in between two trucks, just missing this. It's a stunt driver. Mm -hmm. and he's really putting on a performance. So, and the voiceover says, in Europe, where there are over 50, this is Remy Julian, the world's most famous stunt driver. In Europe, where there are over 50 small types of small cars to choose from, the one that Remy Julian has chosen for more of his, for more of his movies than the other is the Fiat 124. And at that point, the car jumps from a road service. It literally jumps through the air and lands on a ferry boat like five feet away. Mm -hmm. And the voiceover says a family car. So it's got everything I need. The opening scene is a car, you know, kind of leaning into a car of almost on two wheels. It's got sirens. It's got this. It's a chase scene. It's an incredible chase scene. And it gives me inform the information I want. Oh, this guy can choose any car he wants. He chooses a Fiat. He's a great driver. And then it gives me a little joke at the end. It's a family car. It, it suits me. It's not just a nuts car. That's that's pretty good for me. That's that that does a pretty good job for me. You know, uh, the, the early FedEx stuff, the fast talking man. That's a fairly you know popular in our culture kind of commercial is pretty good. Virtually anything that Apple's done over the last. 30 years, I guess this is the anniversary, is it 30 year anniversary of uh, the Mac 1984 spot or 40 year anniversary? I guess it's it'll be 40, 40 in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard to find something. It's hard to find them having um, sounded a false note. I was just talking to a friend about it this morning. It's somehow we love this brand and we let them get away with charging $29 for a charge for a cord. You know, a four dollar cord. We're OK with them charging us twenty nine dollars yeah. because we they made us like them so much. Well, it's funny you mentioned Apple because uh, I agree with you. Their advertising is usually really good. But a couple of years ago, they had um, a Christmas spot of a family traveling to visit the grandfather. I don't know if you've seen that one. Um, I don't remember it. And it was the only ad uh, that ever brought tears to my eyes. It was so powerful. It was pretty amazing. I actually wrote about it on my blog. I'll send it to you. Yeah, there, um, there's one that's running now. We have two that are running now. One right before Christmas called Simon the Snowman. Have you seen that? No. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, you know, about a little girl who saves her snowman uh, in the freezer for a year. <laughs> Uh, it's lovely. And then, oh, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah. and then, you know, the other one, which has gotten a lot of play is actually a product demonstration of the, um, the changing of focal points with the, the film camera where if there's two cops in a car and one confesses to being the murderer and mm -hmm. it shifts focus. It's like, wow, that's, that's a product demonstration, boys and girls. And they made it interesting. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be sure to check it out. Yeah. So uh, what are some of the lessons you've learned from a lifetime in advertising? Well, I, I think, you know, I, you know, I have a pretty strict, you know, personal code. And so there's a, there's a lot of lessons. Um, one is if you look at, if you want to learn how to write, there's George Orwell I guess 75 years ago, wrote an essay, 1948, I think, or 1946, wrote an essay right after World War II called Politics in the English Language. And I, there's six rules smack dab in the middle of it that I'm not going to go through now. But I always use those as the highest order of writing rules. They're mostly never use jargon and don't say anything ugly and if you can say something more simply, say it more simply. Um, and, you know, the beginnings of this conversation were you asking me some fairly 
large questions about, you know, how I think advertising works or why it works. And I like to bring things back to kind of the fundamentals of our species. They work when we're human. You know, they don't work when we try to come up with these nonsensical paradigms and models and concentric circles and Venn diagrams and whatnot. That's all just bullshit. They work. You know, Carl Alley, the famous ad man said, advertising should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. (laughs) So, you know, comfort the afflicted. If you have hemorrhoids, this stuff is going to make you feel better and afflict the comfortable. If you're fat and you never get off your sofa, we should afflict you to get you to a gym. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of what we're supposed to do. And it's, it's pretty simple, you know, um, you know, we're supposed to work to convince people to do something. That's what advertising is. I think that's, that's kind of, that, that's kind of how I like to look at it. I would argue that's what life is about really, because we're yeah. all trying to convince someone of something at some point. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, I mean, my account partner always says my job is to get people to do what they want. I want them to do. <laughs> okay. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. I buy that. I mean, we can have way more, um, you know, ornate conversations about everything. Um, but, um, but, um, I think it's pretty simple. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, following to that question on the lessons you've learned from it, what do you think my audience of mostly creative professionals in the design architecture industry should learn from this conversation? And, and I will be expanding a little bit on your seven kind of, um, uh, commandments of good marketing, but is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, you know, I think the thing, I think there, the way the industry has seemingly in our industry, and I'm sure in, in every industry over the last 25 years, we've really been hit with what feels like, you know, a wave of future shock. Everything is different. We work differently. We, or don't work differently. We, we do everything. We're using computers. We never used computers before, so on and so forth. You know, a lot of what we do is dramatically different from what it used to be. In advertising, you could say the channels, we view things, hear things, read things on are very different from the, how they were 20 years ago, 15 years ago even. But what really doesn't change is our species. Our species still likes a good story. Our species still wants to feel heard. Our species still wants to feel loved and listened to and understood. And, you know, um, I'm not an architect. I'm interested in architecture. And about, uh, I guess when my brother turned 60, so this is five years ago, I went out. He lives in Chicago. I went out to Oak Park because there's about 10 Frank Lloyd Wright homes in Oak Park. Yeah, I mean, it's the the Frank Lloyd Wright. um, uh, It's the mecca of Frank Lloyd Wright. And his studio is out there. And the home he lived in, which I guess at the time, I believe it was 1899. I, I could be wrong, but it was around 1899. That it sounds about right, yeah. It was the prairie. Mm-hmm. So it's not prairie now. It's suburbs now and, and pretty dense suburbs. But he had a whole, as you know, being you know an architect, being a Wright fan, he had a whole thesis about what a doorway should be. Mm-hmm. And it was really duplicative of how early hominids entered a cave. You kind of had to hunch your head. You sat close around a hearth. There was family togetherness. Yes, I'm getting this right. To the point where I know he was only five, eight and a half, but the ceilings are, I'm six, two. The ceilings are a little low. There's a little sense of claustrophobia, but for me, because we're used to something different now, but the, but the overriding feeling was one of warmth and protection. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what our species has always needed from a domicile. And Mm -hmm. I don't, I think we have different ways of designing things and different ways of doing things. And obviously Wright himself evolved. I mean, he worked for more than half a century and not everything he does has that kind of early claustrophobia, what I would call claustrophobia where, where the hearth hearth is like, and the entrance of the house is almost like descending down a, a tube. Um, but a conical uh, structure because the ceiling gets lower. But that sense of like drawing you in and protecting you, 
I think is probably something, I don't know a lot about architecture, but I know enough to, when I'm walking through the city, to understand how some buildings make you want to look into them and some buildings kind of push you away from them. I don't know how it works. I can't design it that way, Mm -hmm. but I know successful retail spaces make you look in and unsuccessful ones allow you to look out. Um, I don't know how that works. Yeah, the the compressed space when you enter a house uh, a la Franck Lloyd Wright is actually a common device. I think it's been a bit lost in in recent times, but... Well, well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, because Um, we forget the essentialness of humanity and we say, well, that's how it used to be done. I'm going to do something new. We don't understand really what it's providing. So let me tell you a, a metaphor, a story, a true story I hear. In the, and I think it applies to both your business and mine. In the early days, post-war, World War II days, um, when you know a lot was changing in the world, uh, s- suburbanization in America, uh, suburbanization, this and that and the other thing, General Mills, uh, the food conglomerate, came out with um, you know instant cake mix. Do you know this story at all? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with it. I think they came out with Betty Crocker instant cake mix. You know, because the moms were, there were more stay-at-home moms in those days. Mm -hmm. And how do you show, how do you semiotically show caring for your family? Except, you know, cook something, make a cake. Mm -hmm. So Betty Crocker, you know, the Betty Crocker, the uh, General Mills company made this cake mix, Betty Crocker. They gave it a pretty name. And, you know, they showed pictures of loving moms in aprons bringing cakes to their children and families. And the product was a failure. Because all you had to do was pour the mix in a bowl and add water and bake it. And women didn't associate those, that action with cooking. Hmm. So they reformulated it and made the, the, the person cooking crack an egg in it. Because the semiotics of cracking an egg said cooking. I see. You, you, understand, you understand what yeah. I'm saying? It's a tiny so, change, but it made a huge difference for them. Yes. Now. Yeah, and it, it, it wasn't really that material. Like I would imagine if you're a if you're an automotive engineer, we regardless of your age, you you have in your head what a racing car should sound like. Yeah. And we don't have an organic sound that comes from a car engine anymore because car engines are more sophisticated. They don't make sounds like that. We actually add it. Because yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. I just bought a car that pumps the supposed engine noise into the cabin because it's not as no- as noisy as it's supposed to be. Right. So so I, I'm sure in architecture, there are things that give you a sense of belonging, of space, of, of, of you know, the, do you know who William White is? Uh, no, I can't say I do. He was, he was kind of an, an, um, an urban, uh, an urban planner. And he did a, a lot of um, famous studies in the 60s and 70s. And one of them, I could send it to you if I could find it, was about how if you're in a public space, you will never just sit down in a chair. If, if you're going to a plaza, you always move the chair before you sit in it, even mm-hmm. if it's just an inch. Yeah. And it's a human thing to make you say, I'm in control. And I'm sure when you design a building, when you design a space, you do that. And we have to do the same thing with with communications. How do you make it feel? How do you make it astute to our species? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. And I think there's when you talk about architecture or marketing like that, it's uh, um, it's lost in a lot of more contemporary projects for sure. It's like it becomes just a collection of spaces, and there's not a lot of thought given into how those work together, the sense of like uh, grandeur or, or uh, of an event that is coming into a nicely designed building. So that makes a perfect sense. You know, I have this movie on my, I, I don't know why I bookmarked it, maybe because I love it. It's about seven minutes long. It's a bit of a documentary on how, when they, what happened in New York when they tore down the original Penn Station, the Mead McKim and White Penn Station. And there's a quotation in the movie from the a Yale uh, architecture critic, uh, Vincent Scully. Mm-hmm. And he was comparing the old Penn Station to the new, not the Moynihan Penn Station, the one in between. 
And he said something like, you know, architecture used to convey a nobility to people. If you think about what you feel like walking into Grand Central as a human, an insignificant human, yeah. you feel important. You might even feel loved by the state <laughs> as opposed to kind of entering Terminal 17 in LaGuardia. You're a necessary evil. You're surrounded by linoleum, dirt and slovenliness and TSA agents that hate you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but you think about, you know, that if, if the overlap between your business and my business is how we make people feel, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in your, in your business, it might be how they feel about going to work or going to shop or going to live in my business. It's how they feel about buying something or traveling somewhere. It's how am I making you feel? You know, and you think about how many commercials, to use your TSA example, seem to be shouting at you. <laughs> you know, like every fucking, excuse me, Verizon spot. Oh, you can swear. That's okay. Um, you, you know what I'm saying, though? They're not treating you like, a, like they like you. Yeah. So um, it's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm a motorcycle and car nut. So I watch a fair amount of stuff on YouTube and elsewhere on those topics. And there's currently a... Um, a Nissan ad for the new Rogue with extremely grating music. And I'm supposed to be the demographic, by the way. Right. But this ad, I just cannot... I, I want to destroy my computer every time I see it because the music is annoying. Uh, it's telling me things I don't care about. And um, yeah, I think this is a, a typical example of like... It's very shouty. It's very showy. It's like, oh, this new SUV, which is very crappy, but it's a basic SUV that every brand has. And it's supposedly going to allow you to have this like wonderful life and go into the country and drive onto yeah. off-roads. And it doesn't because it's, it's a it's an SUV, basic uh, crossover. It doesn't have any real four-wheel drive capability and it's a glorified car. And I just find this ad so annoying. I, I just can't wait for them to retire it. It probably though... And this is, this is kind of the core of what we're talking about. It probably made the dealerships happy because they got their loud music. They got all their copy points and they don't really care about you. Mm -hmm. you. You know, as opposed to, if you remember the Nissan campaign, you know, about dogs loving trucks from a few years ago, mm -hmm. that was much more like they got you. You know, they got that you were going places, you were taking your dog, there were friends and family and fun, fun around, and they weren't shouting at you about things you don't, I mean, you might care about because you're a little bit of a gearhead, but you're not going to get into like torque and shit like that. No. Most people aren't. And, and the fact that it has like a turn-by-turn -turn GPS or Apple CarPlay, like what car doesn't have that these days right. anyway? I mean, Right. It's a parody product. So yeah. they, they haven't really gotten... They haven't really gotten, you know, there's a famous Porsche ad. It's a print ad. And it just shows a Porsche on an open road, you know, out west someplace where there's 10 miles in front of you and the, those monument mountains and all that stuff. It's a spread, if I remember correctly. And I think the headline is something like somewhere on an airplane, a man struggling, opening a bag of peanuts. And it like it gets into that kind of freedom, that soul that uh, maybe it was Harley Davidson uh, for all I know, it could have been either one, but it got to the psyche of why that you're a zigger, not a zagger that you go the other way. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, not, that makes sense. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of um, Porsche ads, especially old school ones that, yeah. uh, that are that way. Um, yeah. I mean, the uh, It, it, it's. I think it's a fascinating topic. You, we could talk about for hours and hours, but I think there's some very important lessons in what you you told us in the last few minutes or 40 minutes or so. Um, the last question I have for you, and it's more of a personal one, is um, you've created this character, uh, <laughs> Z Olding Company CEO. Yeah, I, I apologize for the French accent. No, it's actually it very good, to be honest. Um, what is that about and, and what are you trying to achieve and what kind of response have you gotten from it? Because I think it's hilarious, to be honest. Well, it's really, you know, um, when, you're, when you're a freelancer at an old age, um, you know, there's a million freelancers out there. And I have a little diagram in my head of the people who hire freelancers getting, you know, 65 emails a day from freelancers and all those 
the last 65 people go to the head of the line. You go to the back of the line because they wrote today and you wrote yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of your job as a freelancer, as someone who's constantly looking for work, is to move yourself to the head of the line. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Um, well, I'm so, the same. I'm a freelancer too. So Okay. So I said, well, what can I do that moves me to the head of the line? So I, I run these little ads for myself. I write a blog every day. And then I just, you know, there's this character I, I literally just made up out of whole cloth. I just shot one one day. You know, um, one of the holding company princes is has a French, he's French. Um, and I, I can't do an English accent. I didn't want to just do an American accent because then it would sound like me. So I just said, well, the only thing I can vaguely do, I can't do a German accent. The only thing I can vaguely do is this horrible French accent. And then basically, like a lot of the things you hear politicians say, um, he's basically clueless. He doesn't get that he's got $27 million and everybody else doesn't have enough for pizza. He just doesn't get it. And that's the way a lot of these, that's the way a lot of politicians are. That's the way a lot of you know, corporate leaders are. Uh, because they're in an entirely different world. And it became, I don't, I haven't done one in a while because they're harder to come up with than you'd think. Um, and I don't sit and work at it. When one comes up, I come up with one, I do it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it hasn't, as I think I wrote in my note, it hasn't gotten, I've gotten a lot of people saying, I love it, but I haven't gotten a lot of like comments on the blog. I think because people are afraid. Because if you work for the holding company that's French, you're not allowed to say anything because it looks like I'm making fun of them. And I think just this general fear of, of being on my side because I'm a little anti, I'm anti holding company. So I don't think people want to show allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the world needs contrarians, right? If everybody's is zigging, like you said earlier, someone has to zag. And I think I'm, um, Maybe well, I'm not as uh, as daring or ballsy as you are, but I think it's every freelancer ought to do something like that because it makes them stand out, right? And when you well, stand out, I, you have more uh, more of a, a platform to to be heard. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, I think it was was it Orwell who said, um, "In a world of universal de deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act." I've heard that um, one before. I'm not sure if that's Orwell, but yeah, that's... It's, yeah, it, it is Orwell. In a, in a world of universal deceit, uh, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm doing anything like I'm not... This isn't the Panama Papers. I'm not like exposing that this one stole $16 million or this one did that. I'm basically saying, yeah, I'm taking a lot of time off. I, I made $22 million last year and I'm basically just telling the truth and, and people, Oh my God, he told the truth. I, I read something not too long ago, you know, the way the world is today, we accept when people lie and we're shocked when they tell the truth and it, it should be the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially without getting political these days, like telling yeah. the truth is, a yeah, is truly a revolutionary. Yeah. It's hard not to get political. Yeah. So, Cause it, it is a little political at one level because these guys have manipulated the system, so they're getting rich on your labor. Yeah, well, um, I'm very glad that there's people like you out there because I think they make the world a little more uh, pleasant and fun and bearable. Yeah. So uh, that's all I have for you today. I want to thank you very much for your generosity. I think it was a really interesting conversation and uh, hopefully not the last one. Well, thank you. Thank you for reaching out. Hey, Arno here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll come back for more. Please share with your friends and colleagues and remember to subscribe on our website at rvltr.studio. Until next time, ciao.